Uh, Cody asked me to make a contribution here to the series, Let Us Pray, which I see now has a question mark. So that's even more interesting. And um, in some ways, it's kind of funny to be speaking about this topic, if that's even the right word for it, because if I'm real honest, I know, <laughs> I know we don't know each other right yet, um, but if I'm real honest, prayer gives me trouble. And it's always given me trouble. In fact, if you ask me to pray, you know, particularly in public, I have like a kind of mini freak out inside. I mean, I can do it. I mean, don't ask me to do it, but if I can, <laughs> I can do it. Words can come out of my mouth, but I have this kind of like inner um, tightening in a way. Like I'm not quite sure what to say. And um, something feels slightly off. And sometimes I remember Jesus' line, uh, don't pray in public because you'll think you'll be heard by your many words, but go into your room and close the door. So there's that. And, um, and then there's just the way I was raised. And um, I grew up in a pretty fundamentalist uh, environment, Christian environment. And um, I'm not here to sort of throw that under the bus. In fact, the older I get, the more um, I value certain certain things about my own tradition, about my own past, even though in some ways I've, I've stepped out of that. Um, I particularly value the sincerity, really. Like, I was raised by pretty sincere people, even if, um, I don't know, I don't hold some of the same beliefs and tenets anymore. Um, but prayer was a big part of the conversation when I was a kid. And, and <laughs> I remember being about, I don't know, eight years old or so, and I... I went to this, like, big church, you know, the kind with, like, white columns in the front, you know, that sort of, like, big Baptist church. And I remember sitting there and, and listening and hearing that if I prayed and really believed it, that God could do anything, you know, like move mountains and things like that. So I would, <laughs> I would pray that just for one second, that God would turn the lights out in church, right in the middle of the service. And I, you know, I was eight. I mean, I wasn't like trying to be, you know, um, I don't know, take the church down or something. I just, no, seriously, genuinely thought if I really believed it, then, you know, God would meet me there and turn the lights. If it just, just for a second, just to prove sort of that prayer works or, that, or even that God existed. And, uh, it didn't happen, as far as I know. I would sometimes wonder, though, like, maybe it happened, but I blinked and missed it. <laughs> That's probably what I mean. Prayer has given me trouble. And then we were taught this kind of acronym, and maybe, maybe you heard it if you were raised in a religious background, where, like, you couldn't just go and ask God for things right up front, because that's a little too bold. First, you had to confess, and then you had to praise God. What is it? You had to confess, and then you had to praise then you had to thank God for something, and then you could get around to the requesting of things. And I don't know. I suppose there's a certain, um, I don't know, there's a certain breadth to the conversation of prayer with something like that. On the other hand, it does tend to treat God like a vending machine. You know, if I plug in the right change, out comes some product that I want. And of course, that's how we're wired as a culture. We think in terms of products and possessions and outcomes, and, and we treat God that way. So um, I don't know. Um, I think when I uh, started to leave some of those early frames, my world sort of turned inside out. I went to graduate school in Israel. I had this strong desire to study biblical studies and comparative religion, so I moved to Israel with my wife and um, kids, and um, it wasn't just for me about education. It's like I was barely hanging on to what I would have called faith at that time. I like had one foot in and one foot out. So it was like a much more personal journey than just getting some degree. And one of the things that was swirling in my mind was the question, what is prayer? Like, what is it? How do you do it? Is it real? Does it work? Um, in what ways have I um, been in, the, uh, in my own ways of framing life, you could say, in what ways has it been off when it comes to prayer? 
So when I moved there, I tried just about anything that um, felt new and palatable. Like I started praying the Psalms. I would just start reading the Psalms out loud. Um, I remember I was in Egypt for a field study, and um, on the wall of this cave in Coptic were all these uh, red um, inked uh, uh, psalms. I don't read Coptic, but my professor said, it's Coptic. So I was like, yeah, of course, it's Coptic. Um, but what, they, what the monks had done has, was just written the first words of each psalm, not the whole thing, just the first words to get, to get them going in the repetition because they had the Psalms memorized. And I don't know, I was so inspired by that. So I started reading the Psalms. I started trying some Jewish prayers. Um, eventually, I got into Thomas Merton. He's got a little book of hours. I started trying to keep the hours. I got into St. Francis. The hours are like set times of day where you say these short little prayers. And all of that, I have to be honest with you, I don't even like really talking that much about because really, how you pray is a wildly personal and kind of intimate thing. Like, it's one thing for us to have a conversation, but if I were to ask you, how do you pray? Do you actually pray? That's a wildly intimate question. Even if your answer is, I don't, that still, like, reveals something very close to the human heart. So I think it's an important conversation to be having in the 21st century. What is prayer? And, and if you, <laughs> this is <laughs> newsflash, religion and spirituality is... I don't know, going through a massive upheaval and a kind of turning inside out. And people are leaving traditional ways of framing things and kind of the wheels are coming off on, on one hand. And, and sometimes when people step out of a religious frame, everything goes. And maybe you felt that pull at different times in your own life. And, and yet we still have this question of prayer, I think. I remember I was, I was listening to a talk by a friend of mine. This wasn't like at a church. And he grew up in a sort of religious environment, had, but had become an atheist. And he was like giving this talk. And right in the middle of it, he said something that sounded almost spontaneous. I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't ask him. But he said, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But sometimes when something really good happens or I'm in pain, I pray anyway, even though I don't know to whom I'm speaking. And I thought, okay, there it is. There, there's something about human nature, about our longings, about our desires, about our relationship with what we don't know or the unknown that comes through. And prayer, I don't know, it, it's circling something important. You know, um, Carl Jung, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Jung, and one of the things that he posited was that human beings have a religious instinct. And when he said instinct, he, he meant instinct like the way you would think of it, like your deepest instinct, shelter, food, clothing, sex, add religion. <laughs> and just look around. Just every, I'm a student of history, in every corner of the planet, there's some version of religion or spirituality that forms. And along with that comes a kind of prayer life. Prayer seems to be almost a natural part of how human beings express their longings. So, I don't know, I think it's an important question to be turning over again. And, I don't know, I want to sort of uh, circle around some things this morning when it comes to prayer. And just to make things super simple, I, I remembered um, any, any fans of Anne Lamott. Um, anyway, she's a great writer. She has a book um, called, well, I should back up and say how she came to the title of this book. She said, um, you, you only need three kinds of prayer which is help, thanks, and wow. That's it. So I don't know. It's another way of expressing not only kind of our natural instincts to want to pray or to speak out or to wonder, to long for something, but sort of the flavor of those. Help me. I'm in trouble. Or the universe is amazing, like that quote just before the table from that, um, from that book. Or what was the other one? Wow, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Wow, I can't even remember it. <laughs> Which is something like awe and um, something like wonder. So here's kind of, first I want to be kind of, kind of explicit about 
how I am presently holding prayer, and then I want to look at it from a certain, I don't know, vantage point. I've come to think about prayer largely as a posture, like a way of standing in the world, a stance you might take. Like the way that, again, the author in that quote was taking a stance in looking at the universe in a certain way. It's a posture. That's what I'd like to suggest. You don't have to, like, you know, go with me on this, but I just want to say that's where I'm coming from. I tend to think about it largely as a, as a stance uh, of how you might relate to life or how you might relate to God or how you might relate to one another, how you might relate to the world. That's how I tend to think about prayer these days. Um, in other words, it's like it's an expression of just how we relate to being a human being. Thomas Merton, um, Thomas Merton was a Cistercian monk. The Cistercians are the ones that wear the white robes, and uh, it's a silent order. And uh, anyway, I'll give you this line from Thomas Merton. Listen to this. He said, what I wear is pants, which is, first of all, kind of funny, because imagine the white robe. He's like, what I wear is pants, what I do is live, and how I pray is breathe. Do you feel how that's kind of like a posture in the world, a way of just relating to life, a way of relating to being itself? And this is after, who knows when he penned these words, I think near the end of his life, but this is after many, many decades of living in a monastery where everything is set for you, where the hours are set, where even the prayers are set in a certain language at a certain time. And he still says, well, I'm just a human being, I wear pants, and I breathe. And that's largely how I think about prayer. So I want to invite you just to to consider that today, Um, prayer as a kind of posture. Um, And more than that, if it's a kind of posture, this is the part I want to emphasize today, or I want to just sort of like throw out there. Um, If it's about being in relationship, relationships involve listening. Wouldn't you agree? Like... um, If you and I were to meet after the service and have a little conversation, we would know if the relationship, so to speak, was going well enough if I was listening. If I wasn't, you'd be like, what's this guy's problem? Or right in the middle of the conversation, I just put my headphones in and just kind of nod. No, that's not much of a relationship. And, And this is the dimension of prayer that I think is often left out because people want to to wonder things like, what should I say and how should I say it? That was certainly how I started. How do I pray? How do I do it? What are the words that should come out of my mouth? This is actually what the disciples asked Jesus. They say, teach us how to pray. That's like a legitimate question. Give us the words. And it's almost like um, the Lord's Prayer is Jesus' answer. It's almost like he's slightly annoyed, so he gives them the Lord's Prayer, which should be called the disciples' prayer. It's not his prayer. The disciples are like, hey, show us. Anyway, that's, you know, what's coming out of our mouth. What I, what I want to emphasize today is how to listen. Prayer is a kind of listening, which is another way of saying a kind of being in relationship with life and with the world and with God and with one another. So, um, okay, that was my intro. They told me Cody speaks for like an hour, so <laughs> the lions don't play for a while, so hang on. <laughs> All right, here's a poem. This is one of my favorite poems. Um, Maybe you've heard it before. It's a Mary Oliver poem. It's called The Summer Day. So uh, just sort of let the images, you know, come to you and see what gets stirred up. Who made the world? She says, who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. 
I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I don't know exactly what a prayer is, she says, but I know how to kneel. I know how to pay attention. I know how to fall down in the grass. That's a kind of listening. That's what she's doing. She's listening to the world and relating to the world in a certain way. Did you know that the grasshopper moves her jaws back and forth instead of up and down? It's not that hard to find out. You just have to find a grasshopper. And then you'd have to pay attention. And you might have to fall down into the grass to get that close to find out. You see how sometimes we keep ourselves like at a distance from life as it comes to us? from paying attention. Actually, we have these little devices in our pockets. Have you seen these things? They're like square. <laughs> and they demand a certain kind of attention, which tend to, to distract us from everything else. And almost no one would disagree with what I'm saying. It filters you know, our reality for us. And we've forgotten the way in which a grasshopper eats sugar. Actually, I heard Mary Oliver talk about this poem once. And she said, actually, I was holding a piece of cake in my hand. I just changed it to sugar. So I don't know. I just love that image of her holding a piece of cake. So prayer is a kind of listening. And um, so I want to um, emphasize three dimensions of listening. So part one, listening to your life. Like, what kind of listening are we talking about? Well. How about listening to your life? Like, what's going on in your life? What are habits and patterns that keep emerging? Why do you keep bumping into the same kinds of situations or the same kinds of people or having the same kinds of conversations? What is going on? Or um, you keep bumping into the same kinds of questions or you read something and only, you know, four hours later, someone refers to the thing that you just read. Like, what's going on in your life? Like, what, what would it look like for you to listen more carefully to your own existence, to the habits and patterns that are coming to you? You know, the Greeks had a, had a way of um, talking about life. They made a big deal about two words, which are still around in, in English. Yet I think most people probably mean something slightly differently than the Greeks did. And those two words are fate and destiny. Fate and destiny. Now, fate, according to the Greeks, fate is, is, are really just the things that happen to you that you can do nothing about. That's fate. Like what, you would say? Like your skin color. No one consulted you. Or the zip code in which you were born or your parents. You didn't get like a Rolodex before you emerge into the world. What kind of parents do I want, you know? Definitely ones that are unattentive and, uh, and mean. No. You're just born into the world, into a set of circumstances, into an age and into an era in which you had no choice. And the Greeks called that fate. And fate gives you trouble. How, um, how many of you I don't even know I'm like, I used to teach high school. How many of you? Raise your hands if, if some dimension of life has given you trouble and you don't feel like you chose it. Okay, just one person. Yeah, that's how it is. That's fate. It's not that you never have a choice. It's just that there are certain things in which you don't have a choice. Newsflash, human life is limited and you're going to die. It's something that we all carry, our own mortality, our own DNA, our own family history. Okay, anyway, that's fate. Now, here's what the Greeks said about it. Fate is like a pressure cooker. It's like a cauldron. It's a sealed cauldron, and it heats up. And it heats up, and it forces questions of destiny. 
And that's the other side. If you're listening to your life, if you're really listening to your life, if you're letting yourself cook inside the things that you can do nothing about, something like a star rises in the midst of that, and that might be called destiny. And destiny often has a choice involved, living into the fullness of what you're actually capable of. No matter what your circumstances might be. Like, <laughs> the Olympics are coming. I just thought of this. The Olympics are coming. And here's what it's like watching the Olympics today in the, in the modern world. You get to see one event every couple of hours, and the rest are giant backstories. Correct? And whoever had the most trouble is whoever gets the most airtime. You know, whoever was the most beat down, had the worst circumstances, had the least amount of money, and here they are as an Olympian. Because what's happening is that conversation between fate and destiny is being highlighted. Well, your life is like that. Now, you're probably not an Olympian. Okay? If someone is, that would be, like, amazing. They come up, actually, I am an Olympian. Okay? Most of us aren't going to make the world stage, but we're all um, in the same kind of pressure cooker. Now, what does that have to do with prayer? I'm suggesting, what would it look like to listen to your own life, to fate and destiny, to a sense of calling, to a sense of patterns in your own life, to the story of your own life, to your own pain or wounds or questions, and what might come out of that? Paula de Arce, you maybe heard of her before. She says, God comes to us disguised as our life. All right, now think about that for a second. God comes to us disguised as our life. So when I'm inviting us to listen to your own life, what am I inviting us to do? To listen to the way in which God shows up. God comes to us. God is incarnated in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. That's the invitation, which I'm suggesting is a kind of listening and a kind of prayer. Part two, what's it like, what would it be like to listen to the world like Mary Oliver is in the poem? It's one thing to listen to our life, to the circumstances, but to the world itself, to the black bear, to the swan, to the grasshopper, to the way the light comes um, at a certain angle in the winter to, uh, I don't know, it's, it's like um, we are who we are in relationship to everything else. I mean, we're relational beings. We are who we are in relationship to everything else, to the entire world. What's that um, Simon and Garfunkel song? I am a rock, I am an island. You ever, I am a rock. I shouldn't really sing, I am an island. Um, you, know what, you know what's uh, true about that song? Is that it's not true. <laughs> You're not a rock or an island. I mean, maybe you could say the ego, not to sound too fancy, but the ego is, is like an island. It thinks it's an island. It thinks it's me against the world, but it's actually just in an ocean of interconnect, an interconnected web of being. So when you listen to the world, you're listening to the relationships between things. You're an interwoven being. Do you know there's bacteria in your body that's not technically part of your body, and without it, you couldn't live? Like, that doesn't even make any sense. That's weird. Later on, you'll be like, is that even true? <laughs> yes, there's bacteria in your body that's not part of your living organism, and its life force helps sustain your life force. That's strange. That's another way of saying we're a web of relationships. To listen to the world, to listen to the web of relationships, again, is to listen to God on one level and to allow ourselves to be the relational beings that we are. It's interesting that in Christianity, Christianity isn't the only one, but more explicitly, the way um, the doctrines of Christianity talk about the divine is as a relationship. Like we say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a way of saying the divine is a relational reality. So how are we any different? So what, what would it be like to listen to the world, to allow ourselves to be moved by the world, to find ourselves in deeper relationship to the world? Okay, third possibility. 
First was listening to your life. The second is listening to the world. The third is listening to the other. Like I was saying before, um, <laughs> I don't know why I have this image of talking to you afterwards, but imagine again, I'm, we're, we're having a, a brief conversation afterwards, and um, you, you get this feeling that I'm not listening to you. you know? What's that like? What's that like to not be listened to? Or maybe we could just take the reverse. What's it like to be listened to? Like really, to, to be heard. Like, oh, this person gets what I'm saying. That's an amazing feeling. The opposite feeling is like alienation. The, the, the feeling I'm describing is one of connection. What would it be like to, as a life of prayer, to be a kind of listener? To listen to the other. To allow yourself to be shaped and changed by the other. Let's say we were to go out on a date. Um, again, I don't know why I come up with these weird things. Let's say we're going on a date, and then after the date, I decided that everything I needed to know about you, I learned on that one date. And we would go out again, and you say, yeah, but I already know everything about you, and, you know, you said this, and, you know, that's, you know, there's nothing more to know. I doubt the relationship would go anywhere, correct? That's just not how, first of all, how relationships work, but that's the... The failure to listen is, is, in a way, the ending of a kind of relationship. So I'm asking the same sort of question around prayer. What would it be like to listen to the other? To listen without story or category? To, here's, here's an example. To listen for the truth behind certain words. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but... Um, there's kind of a right-left divide <laughs> going on in the world, you could say, but uh, particularly in, in the U.S. There's a kind of right-left divide. And how do you know what side you're on? I mean, how, like, how long would it take for you to figure out, what would you be doing if you wanted to figure out what side is Kent on? Is he on the left or the right? You'd largely be listening to the words that I spoke, and there's certain code language to clue you in to what side you're on, correct? Now, we can operate like this and say, okay, that's how we should categorize the world. I'm going to listen very carefully for certain code words so that I can categorize you and then put you off to one side. This is someone I like. This is someone I don't. This is someone worth listening to. This is someone who's, n who's not worth listening to. And welcome to politics in the United States of America. What I'm suggesting is something different. What if, as an act of prayer, you started listening for something deeper? Like, what's happening beneath what people are saying? I know there are little code words, but what are people really trying to say? I mean, aren't you trying to say something and you don't even know what it is that you're trying to say, but some kind of truth is trying to come out even if you can't get the words out? Yeah, everybody's like that. So what would it look like to... I don't know, listen with, a, with the ears of your heart, so to speak, instead of for the, with the ears of division. Here's another example. Listening as a form of diminishment. It's kind of a fancy way of saying it, but listening as a form of diminishment. Listening, if I really listen to you, I have to become smaller. Correct? I have to. It's an act of diminishment. If you say to me, you know, this, this past week I biked 30 miles, and I say, I biked 40, you know? You're like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> good for you, you know? But we often behave that way. That's not an act of diminishment. Listening would be something very different, like allowing ourselves to feel smaller is not such a bad thing. In fact, it's a kind of necessary component to the sort of listening that I'm describing. And perhaps the same goes with listening to God or the divine or a mystery. It's a kind of diminishment. And diminishment in a good way. Like, who made the world? <laughs> who made the swan and the black bear? You don't follow that up and say, well, one time I made a papier-mâché bear. It's as good as any other bear. 
No, it's something ridiculous. No, it's a kind of, you feel your own smallness, but in a sort of precious way. Like, okay, I'm just a part of everything else. Might that be a necessary ingredient when it comes to prayer, when it comes to listening, when it comes to God, when it comes to the unknown? Okay. All that leads me up to Jesus' most famous prayer. Cody said, why don't you take a swing at that? So I was like, all right, no problem. And it's really one line that I'm interested in. You've probably heard it, which is, not my will but yours. How many have heard that before? Okay, not my will but yours. And I don't know. So I've been thinking about that passage. And first of all, Jesus prays that prayer in the garden. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is just before he's arrested. And he says something right before it. He says, if it's possible for this cup to pass for me, which is sort of, a, I don't know, a metaphoric way of saying, I don't think things are going are gonna to go very well. So if there's some other way, you know, I'm expressing my desire for that. He says, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me, not, not my will but yours. Which, again, hear that. Hear that in its own raw authentic honesty for a moment. If there's another way, which is sort of like saying, Jesus doesn't know what's going to happen. If there's another way, it's expressing some desire. And then he says, not my will, but yours. So I don't know, I have three, three or four reflections on this sort of prayer in Jesus's darkest hour. And try to um, put when I'm try to allow what I'm, um, what I'm going to say about this to be in relationship with everything I've said so far about listening. Okay, here's the first point I want to say, make about it. First of all, you have to have a will to have a prayer like this. <laughs> you have to have some desires. You have to want things to go a certain way. It's not the absence of having a will or desires or to want life to go a certain way. That's often how this prayer is misused. Not my will, but yours. You shouldn't have one. It's actually the opposite. Jesus is saying, I don't think this is going to go well, so I'm asking, hey, if there's some other way, can that be the case? So you have to have a will to let it go, you could say, in the first place. You have to have a certain sense of, of who you are and where you stand and what you'd like to see happen. The second dimension, I think, is that you have to bump in to your own uncertainties. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, Radiohead, the band. They have a great song, and it's called I Might Be Wrong. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Like, okay, I have a will. I'd like to see things go a certain way, but also I might be wrong. I'm not so sure. You have to bump into your own uncertainties. Now, what a vulnerable, um, what a vulnerable way of living, or way of being in the world, to both have some desires and to and to also feel your own uncertainties and the fact that you might be wrong about something. The third dimension I think that's important about this is kind of this open-handed surrender. So do me a favor and just clench your fists, okay? Like, no, but like really clench them like you're going to punch me, okay? But just feel, no, feel it and try to feel the power of that. There's a time and a place for this kind of, um, I don't know, energy. Okay, now relax your hands. The prayer is something like that, I think. It's sort of like, okay, I have a will, I have some desires, and also at the same time, I'm trying to relax them, I'm trying to open my hands. Not my will, but yours. Like, All right, that's a kind of open-handed surrender, I would, I would call it. And here's the fourth dimension of this. You might have to act anyway in the world. What's what's 
kind of strange about this moment in the garden. You know, Jesus says, not my will, but yours. And there's, is that there's no voice. There's no answer. There's no like, do you remember at the beginning of Jesus' life? It says, after the baptism, the sky was torn open and he heard a voice. And the voice said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. What is Jesus here in the garden? As far as we know, nothing. Imagine saying, not my will but yours, and having that met with silence. That seems to be what's going on here. Talk about an an open-handed surrender. And he still has to act anyway. And you know what he does? He wakes his disciples up and says, my betrayer, my accuser is coming. And he moves in the world. He acts in the world anyway. So is it possible to live with a kind of open-handedness and a kind of humility and act in the world in a certain way, knowing you might be wrong? (laughs) And I think that's what Jesus is sort of inviting inviting us into. Okay. I want to end with a little passage here from, from Thomas Merton. Again, the Cistercian monk who wears pants. <laughs> and this is a very, I think, uh, rich passage here, and here's why I want to read it. I think prayer, prayer as posture, prayer as act of listening, is a pathway to relating to the cosmic, to the transcendent, to the divine, to the whole, to the mystery, we could say. And you can hear it in his words. Notice this first part. For the world and time are the dance of the Lord in emptiness. For the world and time are the dance of the Lord in emptiness. Now, I'm not really going to explain that to you because I'd need several other hours. And then at the end, I'd say, I don't know what he's talking about. But the world and time, our world, Our sense of time, the clock is ticking. Like Mary Oliver says, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? He says all of that, the world and time and relationships and energies and patterns and wounds and hopes and longings and gifts and kids and grandkids and losses, all of that, he says, is the dance of the Lord in emptiness. It's a dance. It's a dance party. I'm adding that part. It's a dance party. It's a way of the entire cosmos dancing with the Lord in a vast emptiness. So what is it that you're a part of? What is it that you're trying to listen to? What is it that you're trying to loosen your grip and allow? Perhaps it's something much more like a dance than a struggle. I'm not saying there's not struggle. We just read about Jesus in the garden. This is an incredibly painful world at times, and also it's a dance of the Lord in emptiness. The silence of the spheres is the music of a wedding feast. Anybody seen those pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope? Like, I'm sorry, but they freak me out. I think, what is this place? What is the world? What is the universe? There are black holes that bend time. That doesn't even make any sense. What is the world? Merton says, the silence of the spheres is the music of a wedding feast in which you, for one reason or another, by no choice of your own, no one consulted you, you're a participant in this dance party, in the music of a wedding feast. He goes on. The more we persist in misunderstanding the phenomena of life, the more we analyze them out into strange finalities and complex purposes of our own. This is basically what I do full-time, okay? 
trying to analyze everything out into its strange finalities, the more we involve ourselves in sadness, absurdity, and despair. I'll translate that. You can't figure life out. You really, you can't. It's kind of absurd at times. So feel that prayer again. Not my will, but yours. Do you feel how that's so much different than I've got to figure it out. I have to have the right beliefs. I have to have the right worldview. I have to have the right political party. I have to have the right job, the right spouse, the right bank account. You feel how that, that clinging energy? He goes on. But it doesn't matter much <laughs> after all that. We involve ourselves in absurdity, despair. He says, ah, it doesn't matter all that much because no despair of ours can alter the reality of things or stain the joy of the cosmic dance, which is always there, always there, always present. The cosmic dance of the mystery of God and emptiness in which you and I are participants. Indeed, we are in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of us, for it beats in our very blood whether we want it to or not. Yet the fact remains that we are invited to forget ourselves on purpose. Think about that prayer, not my will but yours. Forget yourself on purpose. <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh. <laughs> that's not, that's not going to make for an Instagram post. Okay, Forget yourself on purpose. Instagram is the opposite. Facebook is the opposite. Look at me. And he's saying, forget yourself on purpose for a minute. Just forget it. And cast our awful solemnity to the winds and join the general dance. Now, what would it look like for you to join the general dance? the general dance of the cosmos, the general dance of the ravens and the birds and the air and the grasshoppers and the next conversation you have, the next interaction you have, dropping categories and labels and join the general dance. It's the kind of prayer I'm inviting you to ponder this morning. Thanks for having me.